thank you all for coming. Before we start, the most important announcement is that there will be refreshments and snacks after the talk, just out in the hallway. And you can also use that time to ask any additional questions that we don't cover uh, in this talk this afternoon. So thanks all for being here. This is an awesome turnout, and it's great to see so many new faces, as well as the students who have forced for my class to be here today. Um, but my name is Josh Kaplan. I'm one of the new assistant professors in the behavioral neuroscience program, part of the psychology department. And my research specialty is in cannabis science. Specifically, I'm interested in better understanding the therapeutic potential of cannabis, as well as its developmental impacts, by understanding how the many uh, chemicals that the plant produces act on different brain systems. And I hope to better understand that by identifying the complex interactions that occur between the chemicals that the plant produces specific neural mechanisms at particular doses. Now when I speak to physicians and scientists, as well as the general public, it feels like one of the biggest misunderstandings with regards to cannabis is that there's this idea that cannabis is cannabis is cannabis, that all cannabis is equal with regards to its therapeutic benefits, but also its harm. If you go to a doctor, there might be just a checkbox asking you, well, what type of what type of other drugs are you on, and there's a box for cannabis. It doesn't ask you what type. And that has really limited our scientific understanding of how cannabis is affecting the brain and body, and really limited its therapeutic potential. So this talk is geared to both the scientist as well as the potential user who recognizes that we are really in uncharted territory when it comes to the immense number of products that are available today. And I think that by better understanding this cannabis code, that is, the interaction between the many chem chemicals at specific doses will lead to both safer and more effective therapies. So it's pretty obvious that cannabis laws have loosened across this country and globally as well. But even in states that have legal recreational cannabis, the laws and regulations surrounding its use vary drastically from state to state. And this has made it nearly impossible to generalize the effects of cannabis at the population level from one state across to other states. But I believe that we can gain really important scientific insight into the effects of cannabis on the brain using well-controlled preclinical models in the laboratory, as long as we can mimic the human use patterns. And that idea has been shockingly lacking, though, in the scientific field until recently. And I'll be sharing with you some of our lab strategies to overcome those barriers. But first, we have to begin by describing what it is we're, what it is we're talking about when we're talking about cannabis or weed, or marijuana, or ganja, or whatever you call it. But we're talking about a plant, and this plant produces hundreds of different chemicals that fall into two main classes. You have the terpenes, which give the cannabis its unique odor and flavor, and then you have the cannabinoids, which act on many different systems within the brain and body to have the, their effects. And there are thousands of different genetic strains of cannabis, and each one has its unique profile of cannabinoids and terpenes. And there are thousands just within the state of Washington itself, including some that are grown here in Bellingham. And so knowing what's in the cannabis that you are using is a critical element in predicting both its therapeutic benefits as well as its side effect risk. So when we're talking about the cannabinoids, the two most prominent ones that you're probably familiar with are delta-9 THC and cannabidiol, which is often just abbreviated as CBD. Now THC is the primary high-inducing cannabinoid sought after by recreational users who are looking to get stoned. And it has these effects by activating the CB1 receptor in the brain. Now beyond some of the recreational effects, THC has been known to have medicinal effects as well and has been used for hundreds of years to treat everything from nausea to migraines and pain. But cannabidiol is thought to be the main driver of the therapeutic benefits of cannabis. And CBD is non-high inducing, 
but it has this wide-ranging therapeutic spectrum for treating things such as epilepsy, pain, anxiety, depression, and a host of additional conditions. And it has these effects by acting on a wide spectrum of neural targets in the brain. And we'll talk about those later. But the relative concentration or distribution of THC to CBD greatly impacts the effect that cannabis has on the brain and body. And as I mentioned, there are thousands of different strains just grown here in the state of Washington. Now this graph up here shows you each one of those strains plotted as a function of its THC levels and CBD levels. Now, first of all, you can see that one, there are a whole bunch of strains that are specific to the state of Washington. There is a wide variety of those strains, but that they also generally fall into three main categories. You have this, the THC-rich strains down here, which are high in THC, low in CBD levels. So these are going to be sought after by recreational users who are looking to get high. But they're not going to have much in the way of therapeutic benefits, and also come with a much higher risk of negative side effects. On the other hand, we have these CBD-rich strains, which are rich in cannabidiol, low in THC, and these don't have much in the way of recreational benefits because they're not going to get you high, but they are thought to have a wide variety of therapeutic effects. But over the last 10 years, there's also been an emergence of this other class of a more balanced THC and CBD ratio. And there have been increasing numbers of both preclinical as well as clinical reports demonstrating the improved therapeutic benefits that can be obtained with a balanced THC and CBD ratio. So if you go to a rec shop, you're going to see a product, at least in the state of Washington, that has a label telling you what's in it. It's going to also give you the percentage of THC as well as CBD that's available in the product. And this gives you a hint as to what the general effects on the body and brain are going to be. So in this case, we have a THC-rich strain that has a lot of THC, very low levels of CBD. So this is going to have more recreational purposes if you're looking to get stoned, but would not be the ideal choice for its therapeutic per, uh, benefits. So there are several questions that I'd like to address today. The first is whether or not there's truly a case for cannabis use in medicine. If there is, how does it work? What are some of the targets in the brain and body by which it's acting to achieve these effects? I'd also like to address what some of those current limitations are um, to using cannabis as medicine, along with how we can improve the medicine that's available. And then lastly, I'll close with what we're going to do about it, what my lab is going to do to improve cannabis-based therapies. So, the first question, is cannabis, uh, can cannabis be medicine, I think represents just, first of all, a really interesting idea that in the case of cannabis use, it really does represent a rare case in medicinal pharmacology. Normally, when you have a disease state, you identify the brain mechanism that is compromised, and then you develop a drug to target that brain mechanism. You test it in preclinical models in the laboratory and then translate it to human clinical trials. But in the case of cannabis, the trajectory has been reversed. Humans are using cannabis-based therapies for a number of different therapeutic purposes ever before there was the scientific validation for their use. And I think this is really nicely exemplified in this case, demonstrated by this girl here named Charlotte Fiji. Now, Charlotte has a form of uh, pediatric epilepsy known as Dravet syndrome, where she was experiencing hundreds of seizures a week that were not controlled by the traditional medications that were prescribed to her. And it wasn't until she tried a CBD extract, oil with a high amount of CBD, that she was able to gain control over her seizures, dropping the frequency to practically nothing. Now, her case and others have led to the studying of cannabidiol as a potentially powerful anti-epileptic tool 
In the laboratory, and if any of you were at my job talk last year, you will remember that my postdoctoral work looked at the um, preclinical efficacy of CBD in treating, a, a treating epilepsy in a mouse model of Dravet syndrome. And we indeed were able to empirically confirm that CBD was a powerful anti-epileptic tool, and we were able to identify its neural mechanism. We showed that it acts by blocking the GPR55 receptors activity in the brain, and this in turn reduced the seizures. So the case of epilepsy is just one of many different therapeutic purposes that people are using cannabis for out there in the world, and we are then learning from it within the scientific community, bringing it into the laboratory and conducting empirical tests. But this large increase in the use of medicinal cannabis for a variety of different disorders has led to this booming market, um, both within the United States as well as globally. And now people can use a variety of different products to treat whatever disorder they're seeking to treat. The traditional route is still available. You can combust the flower so you can smoke the plant. But you can also use a whole bunch of additional techniques to get it into your body. You can use a CBD tincture or any sort of cannabis extract tincture. You can eat it. You can use it as a suppository. You can rub it on your skin. You name it, people have come up with ways to get it into their body. And so there's been this amassing amount of anecdotal reports of the therapeutic uses of cannabis that have then led to the development of clinical trials to empirically test its <coughs> efficacy in controlled systems. So what this figure shows here is the kind of relative number of clinical trials or the size of the clinical trials for a variety of different conditions, from treating certain types of cancer, to muscle spasticity and multiple sclerosis and ALS, to pain, as a function of the clinical trial phase, as well as the degree of cannabis sophistication. So how well controlled the cannabis dosing and formulations are. Now, one of the greatest um, talking points among opponents of medicinal cannabis is that the clinical trials do not exist to justify its use in the clinic. And I'll acknowledge that we are definitely lacking in the degree of clinical trials that are available, especially when it comes to dosing protocols. But to say that there aren't any clinical trials I think is just inaccurate. And by 2017, as demonstrated here, there have been over 18,000 patients that have undergone successful or participated in successful clinical trials um, using different cannabis formulas um, for treating a variety of disorders. Now, one of the problems, though, is that many of these clinical trials use specific cannabis formulations that were not available to the general public. But still, I think this provides an exciting glimpse into the potential of cannabis-based therapies for a number of different conditions that are otherwise resistant to the traditional medications that are available. So next, I'd like to address how cannabis is affecting the brain and body to achieve some of these therapeutic effects that were observed in preclinical models as well as in those clinical studies I just showed you. And the effects of cannabis are largely being conveyed through the actions of THC and CBD. Now, in this study, uh, the authors looked at the effect of IV administration of either THC, a placebo, or cannabidiol in a word retrieval task, um, and looked at the functional, uh, or the, the, the brain activity levels using a functional MRI scan. And we see that THC reduced the activity in both the prefrontal cortex and the striatum, two important brain regions that are important uh, in the execution of this word retrieval task. And this coincided with an impairment in performance. CBD, on the other hand, while it certainly didn't reduce activity, and in fact seemed to even increase it, which may be um, a sign that it uh, was having some minor degree of anxiolytic effects and reducing the stress while in the magnet and taking this test. So this suggests that THC and CBD can have opposite actions 
on brain function that likely represent different actions um, on opposing neural mechanisms. And in addition to the opposite effects of THC and CBD on brain activation, we also see that CBD can be a protective tool against some of the adverse consequences of THC intoxication. So too much THC exposure can be associated with things like acute anxiety, acute paranoia, even the induction of psychotic symptoms. But here we see that pretreatment with CBD <coughs> reduced the magnitude of the psychotic symptoms that were induced by THC. So therefore, the cannabinoid compositions can be optimized not just to achieve certain therapeutic benefits, but also to limit the adverse effects. And that's something that's important to keep in mind when developing optimized therapies. But one of the greatest challenges to studying the impact of cannabis, especially the long-term impacts of cannabis on the brain and body, has been this rapidly changing landscape in the cannabis products that, and strains that are available. Over the last 30 or 40 years, we've seen that the THC potency has quadrupled in the average strain that is available on the market. Even just within the last 20 or 30 years, we see that THC levels have risen from about 4 to 8 percent to between 10 and 24 percent. And a paper just came out last week saying that the average THC level in strains within the United States are now at 18 percent THC. It's very different from your father or your parents or your grandparents' cannabis that they used back in the 70s. So the THC levels are rising, but the CBD levels are falling along with this increase in THC. And as I just mentioned to you, CBD can protect against some of the negative effects driven by THC. <coughs> so you can now get higher than ever, but it comes at a greater cost and a greater risk for adverse effects. At the same time, though, we've seen this rise in the popularity of medicinally relevant cannabis strains that now have greater levels of CBD than THC in them. And so really what we're looking at here are two very different products, two very different plants that are going to have opposite effects seemingly on the way that your brain is functioning, the therapeutic effects that can be obtained, as well as the risk of side effects. So that's something to really keep in mind when you're thinking about cannabis in general. The next question is, well, what type? What do you mean by that? There always has to be a follow-up when somebody says, do you want to try cannabis? Or I want cannabis. What are we talking about? Now, I think one of the kind of most difficult aspects of using cannabis for therapeutic purposes is how important the dosing is when it comes to using THC and CBD to treat a number of conditions. So there have been numerous preclinical and clinical studies that have demonstrated that whether we're talking about THC alone or CBD alone or the two in combination, the dosing is critical. And I like to think about this like the, the Goldilocks zone of optimal dosing. You don't want too little and you don't want too much. So we have this really narrow window for optimal dosing to achieve therapeutic benefits. And this Goldilocks zone, if you will, is reflected in a bunch of inverted U dose response curves for a number of different disorders. Again, preclinical and clinical evidence has demonstrated that there is a very narrow dose response window for THC's ability to reduce anxiety. And if you overshoot this window, THC's anxiolytic effects become anxiogenic. And you can have a really adverse consequence by experiencing this acute level of anxiety. CBD's ability to treat anxiety and depression also falls within a narrow dose window where we see that moderate <coughs> doses of CBD are more effective than low doses and more effective than high doses. More is not always better when we're talking about cannabis use 
for therapeutic purposes. And a number of people that I've talked to report that, well, CBD just didn't work for me until I lowered the dose. And then I started to see therapeutic benefits. And so keeping this in mind that the dosing is critical also leads to this really important question of, well, how do we interpret the null results that have been demonstrated in the literature? With many of the positive clinical trials that have been reported, there have also been many that have shown that, well, cannabis is just doesn't really seem to do anything. Well, does it not do anything because that product truly is not effective at treating that condition? Or do we just fall outside of the optimal dosing window? And so again, it always comes back to the importance of dose. Now, you might be thinking, well, how do I know what the proper dose is? And I don't have an answer to tell you. Unfortunately, there are no guidelines for telling you what the proper dose of CBD is, for instance, to treat anxiety. It comes down to a very costly, potentially harmful, and in the end, very frustrating trial and error game, where you just have to start low and go slow and see what works for you. But I want to come back to the reason why we have this inverted U-dose response curve in the first place, and that stems from the many different targets that these cannabinoids have on the brain and body. And so when we're talking about THC, for instance, that high inducing cannabinoid, it's having its euphoric and intoxicating actions by activating CB1 receptors on the presynaptic neuron. This is reducing calcium influx into the bouton, which in turn is reducing neurotransmitter release. I hope to see some of my 220 students going, yeah. <laughs> but it's reducing neurotransmitter release, and this in turn is having cognitive effects, motor effects, as well as contributing to that high that you're experiencing. In addition to its actions on CB1 receptors, it's also activating CB2 receptors in the brain and the body. And these, this activation of CB2 receptors contributes to its anti-inflammatory properties. And a study published 30 years ago did a comparison study of THC's uh, anti-inflammatory properties against those of aspirin and hydrocortisone, finding that THC was a really strong anti-inflammatory. 20 times the strength of aspirin and twice that of hydrocortisone. And again, this is through actions on the brain's own endocannabinoid receptors, of which we have two that have been identified so far. Um, CB1 receptors are the primary receptors that are found in the central nervous system. They're found in the brain and the spinal cord. And CB2 receptors are found largely in immune tissues throughout the body, but they've had an increasingly um, powerful role in the brain in cases of injury as well as neurodegenerative and um, age-related diseases. So these receptors are similar mainly in name alone. They only share 44% amino acid sequence homology. And this not only affects their general function in the brain and body, but it also makes them uniquely sensitive to different chemicals, such as the cannabinoids. And when it comes to CBD, CBD has a vastly different uh, activation profile within the brain and body. It can weakly activate CB2 receptors, which contributes to some of its anti-inflammatory properties, but it has the opposite effect on CB1 receptors. So CBD is a negative allosteric modulator of CB1 receptors, which is one of the reasons that it can protect against some of those intoxicating effects of THC. It also can antagonize the GPR55 receptor, which is thought to contribute to its anti-epileptic properties. It activates serotonin 5-HT1A receptors, which contributes to its anxiety and antidepressant effects. And it can block the activity of the hydrolyzing <laughs> enzyme, FAAH, for the endocannabinoid anandamide. And among many, many effects this has, it's thought to contribute to some of the benefits that are now being reported in the treatment of autism. So CBD has this diverse set of neural targets. And 
this in part explains why we see this Goldilocks zone of its therapeutic benefits, because as we increase in dose, there's the onset of more and more of these neural targets that now override the effect of CBD's actions at lower doses. So if we're looking at treating anxiety, which uses kind of a low to moderate dose, well, we have CBD's actions on a number of these receptors. But as we go to higher and higher doses, like, is, like those that are being used to treat epilepsy, these kids who are using CBD to treat epilepsy are taking on the orders of like 1,000 milligrams a day. These neural targets are now overriding the effects at the lower doses, and you're losing the therapeutic benefits that are achieved at lower doses. Which comes back to the point that dosing is a critical component of proper and effective therapeutic use. And again, these dosing protocols just don't exist, so you have to figure it out for yourself. If you're going to figure it out for yourself using a trial and error method, well, one of the ways to do that is to have a product or something that has some degree of consistency to it, where you know what you're consuming into your body so that the next time you can adjust appropriately. That's just the standard trial and error method. The problem with that is that in part due to the lack of general regulation within the cannabis industry, both in the state of Washington and across the country, there is a great degree of variability and inconsistency across the testing within different testing facilities, even within the state of Washington itself. What we're looking at here is the THC levels and CBD levels of a number of different strains tested by six different labs. I hope you can see that the THC levels in the same, in, in one strain tested by lab A is vastly different than the THC levels that were tested by lab F. So if you are depending on a very narrow dosing window, you're expecting to have 100 milligrams of CBD in that particular product, but one lab is telling you one thing and the other lab is telling you another, I, I hope you can start to appreciate that this makes your use especially challenging and identifying the optimal dose that works for you and being able to replicate that over and over becomes hard when the variability across labs is as great as it is. And I'm not convinced that there's going to be a solution to this until there's better federal oversight and regulation. Sometimes a little bit of oversight is good. Um, and there are a number of reasons why this may have presented itself, but I don't have time to get into that. So when we're talking about some of the current limitations beyond just the dosing, it really does come down to two factors with regards to safety. It comes down to what's in it, what are you taking into your body, and at what dose. Now, one of the general benefits of using cannabis as medicine, as compared to some of the other drugs that are currently available, both that are prescribed and unprescribed, is that it has a relatively high therapeutic index. Now, the therapeutic index is merely the difference between the therapeutic dose so the one that's used to achieve a given uh, therapeutic effect, compared to the toxic dose, the one that's going to elicit a negative or adverse consequence. And so a larger therapeutic index, the difference between these two lines, is associated with a greater safety profile. But the therapeutic index for cannabis depends on the relative amount of THC to CBD. So, THC-rich cannabis has a much lower therapeutic index than CBD, especially during the time in development when the brain is still maturing. Now, CBD, however, is thought to have a much higher therapeutic index at all stages of brain development. And this has led to the use among many children um, given by their parents uh, to treat a variety of disorders such as autism, ADD, epilepsy, anxiety, and a host of other conditions. 
based on the assumption that CBD is safe on the developing brain. But I'll acknowledge that we really do not have the answer to this. As far as I know, there have been no studies showing the long-term safety profile of, can of CBD on the developing brain. And this is an area that my lab will hopefully um, be able to fill in this line moving forward. But I want you to keep in mind that this therapeutic index is affected by three main factors. It's affected by the cannabinoid composition, the relative ratio of THC to CBD, the use patterns, how frequently you are using it, as well as the route of administration. And I don't have time to go into the importance of the route of administration and how that differentially affects cannabis' actions, but it's generally thought that, that vaping uh, cannabis or using a tincture is a safer route of administration than eating an edible. And there are a number of reasons why that's the case, which I can get into later if people are interested. So the main idea is that cannabis composition and dose determine the therapeutic efficacy and risk for <coughs> negative effects. But it's important to keep in mind that there's more to cannabis than just THC and CBD. These two cannabinoids alone do not tell the whole story. And there's been an increasing appreciation for the role that these other minor cannabinoids play in cannabis' therapeutic benefits. For instance, Cannabichromine has been recently shown to have anti-inflammatory effects, to be an analgesic, and have antidepressant effects. Cannabigerol can be used as an analgesic as well as an antifungal. Tetrahydrocannabivarin, or THCV, has been shown across a number of different models to be anticonvulsant, including uh, several more that just were published last week. And it's thought that these other cannabinoids can interact with THC and CBD to potentially boost the therapeutic properties of those cannabinoids. And in addition to the cannabinoids themselves, there are also this class of terpenes, which again, give cannabis its unique odor and flavor. Without the terpenes, cannabis has no smell. So this does drive a lot of the experience that's associated with cannabis use. Now, these, can, uh, these terpenes are gaining appreciation within the field for the, the therapeutic properties that they may have on their own. For instance, linalool, which comes from lavender, has been shown to have pain relieving effects, sedating effects, as well as being an anxiolytic. beta um, which gives black pepper its <coughs> spiciness, has anti-inflammatory effects by activating CB2 receptors. So we see these cannabinoids acting on, the, or excuse me, these terpenes, at least beta caryophylline acting on the endocannabinoid receptors that THC and CBD can act upon. Limonene comes from the citrus peels of fruit, can be stimulating and energizing. And myrcene, which comes from lemongrass, has sedating effects, it can be analgesic. And it's thought that myrcene, in combination with THC contributes to that highly sedating kind of couch lock effect that you can experience from certain types of strains. Now, again, these terpenes and cannabinoids are interacting with THC and CBD to drive the effects of the cannabis product that is available. If you think about this with like a car analogy, if you're trying to get from point A to point B, THC and CBD are kind of like the engine of that car. They're, what, they're the horsepower, they're the torque, they're what's going to get you to your destination. But it's the minor cannabinoids and the terpenes that are thought to contribute to the other elements of the ride. How smooth that ride is, how quiet it might be in the car, the sound system, how sleek the interior is. Those types of elements that contribute to the overall experience with cannabis are thought to be driven by the terpenes and the minor cannabinoids. So they're gaining a really, a, a much larger appreciation for their effects. Now the question then becomes, well how are these terpenes working? Are they acting through modulating our olfactory system or through direct action in the brain? And at least when it comes to linalool, um, the anti-anxiety effects that have been observed with linalool 
at least preclinically, using a, an elevated plus maze, which is a preclinical assay of anxiety in rodents, those uh, anxiolytic effects were lost following the ablation of olfactory neurons, suggesting that these effects are mediated by the olfactory system, likely by acting on limbic function to improve mood. And it's unclear how some of these other terpenes uh, convey their effect, if it's through interacting with the olfactory system or if it's through direct action on uh, brain systems. And that's something that I'd love to explore further. <coughs> So the combination of the cannabinoids along with the terpenes can play a really important role in the overall effects of the drug. And this general concept has come to be known as the entourage effect, which basically states that multiple cannabinoids along with terpenes have better therapeutic benefits than individual cannabinoids on their own. So generally that means that a whole plant extract containing all of these components would have better therapeutic purposes or benefits than CBD alone. And this can be, this has been shown across a variety of different conditions, but here I'm showing you the effect of the entourage effect, uh, the benefits of the entourage effect on uh, inflammation and pain in an animal model of inflammatory signaling. So here we see the effects of CBD in an isolate form on cytokine levels that are associated with inflammatory signals. And we see a very limited dose response window where five milligrams per kilogram were effective at reducing these pro-inflammatory cytokines, but that effect was lost at higher doses. However, when a whole plant extract was used containing 18% um, CBD and 1% THC, along with some of the terpenes as well, we see a much stronger effect and extended effect um, within that dosing window of a whole plant extract. So this is also observed um, across a longer duration, for a longer duration of the effects of a whole plant extract compared to CBD alone. So up here, we're looking at the effects of CBD or the whole plant extract on the size of the inflammatory response, so the paw thickness, that level of inflammation, as well as the paw withdrawal threshold, which is an assessment of kind of the pain threshold, um, as a function of time, so two hours following injection in white, six hours following injection in light gray, and a day later in dark gray. And I hope you can, I, you can appreciate from these figures here that the whole plant extract shown here on the right, leads to a stronger reduction in pain that lasts longer. So these whole plant extracts can also extend the length of the drug's effects. Not only extending the dosing window, but can extend the length of the drug's effects. <coughs> Additionally, we can see this in tests of CBD's anti-epileptic effects. But here, what I want you to take away is that it's not just the whole plant extract that matters, but it's what's within that whole plant extract that matters. What the composition of the terpenes are, what the composition of the minor cannabinoids are. In this study here, we're looking at the effect of five different whole plant extracts containing CBD, on the latency to a seizure, so the anti-epileptic effects in a rodent model of toxin-induced seizures. And we see that in some of those CBD extracts, we got a much longer latency to the seizure of better anti-epileptic effects than others. So it's not just to say that the whole plant extract matters, but what's in that whole plant extract that leads to an improvement in the therapeutic uh, benefits. So what beyond the CBD molecule can improve therapy? And this is an area that my lab is especially interested in identifying. So identifying the optimal cannabinoid and terpene compositions will expand the therapeutic window and improve overall efficacy. This is a critical element, especially when we're thinking about this in the context of diseases that have multiple symptoms that respond or need a very narrow 
a specific dose of CBD to treat those given symptoms. So for example, we see this in the case of Dravet syndrome, going back to that case study of Charlotte Fiji. Um, with Dravet syndrome, we can model this in the laboratory. And we see that symptoms such as epileptic seizures, as well as autism-like social deficits, cannot be treated simultaneously with the same dose. So these are data from my postdoctoral work showing that in order to treat febrile seizures, so seizures that are brought about by high temperatures, by, by a fever essentially, as well as spontaneous seizures that come about naturally, are only treated effectively at high doses of CBD, at about 100 milligrams per kilogram. But if we look at its benefits on autism-like social deficits, using the three-chamber test of social interaction, which is merely just asking, basically looking at the mouse and seeing if it wants to interact with another mouse or not, the improvements to this behavior by CBD are lost once we get beyond a dose of 20 milligrams per kilogram thereby making it impossible to simultaneously treat seizures as well as the social deficits using the same dose. But I hope that by better understanding this kind of entourage effect mechanism, how these different terpenes and cannabinoids are working together at the cellular level, we can expand this dosing window so that we can simultaneously treat both the seizures and the autism like social deficits or multiple symptoms in whatever condition we're talking about using the same dose of the drug. So the directions that my lab are going, uh, will be going in here are going to be based around improving cannabis-based medicines and better understanding its effects on the developing brain. And we plan to do this by using exposure techniques that mimic human use patterns. I can't express how frustrated it is to read the literature and, and see how lacking that the just general idea is going forward. And, and I'll be honest, I mean, we did that in my postdoctoral work where we were injecting mice, but I don't know many humans that are injecting THC or CBD into their veins or into their guts, right? People are using it through a variety of different techniques that don't involve a needle. And so we need to be integrating this into the laboratory. And this is especially important in the light of some recent studies that have been reported. There have been a number of studies that have demonstrated that injection of THC can impair working memory performance in rats. But a study was just, that just came out last month showing that if you expose rats to THC-rich cigarettes, so if you expose them to the smoke from these cigarettes, not only does the, the THC not impair their working memory performance, but in the underperforming or underachieving animals that were just, you know, if you think of their performance along a Gaussian distribution, some are just going to be worse off. The THC actually improved some of their performance. So, this just demonstrates, I think, the importance of route of administration in being able to generalize the effects that we see in the lab to humans. And after all, that's the point, right? So we're going to do this using passive inhalation chambers, which we have in our lab. Essentially, we're in hot box mice with <laughs> combusted flowers or vaporized oil. And we're going to see how this route of administration impacts behavior and brain development. Additionally, the second most common route of administration that people are using cannabis by is by eating it, by ingesting it. And so we're going to give the mice edibles. We're going to diffuse cannabinoids into a gelatin-like uh, substance and give that to the animals. And this is what they're going to eat as their food source, allowing them to get the THC and CBD and all those other elements into their body through oral consumption. And this is really important because oral, orally consuming cannabis has a vastly different effect on the pharmacokinetic properties than smoking or vaping cannabis. The blood levels of the cannabis are lower, but they last for longer. And in addition, the different cannabinoids, the, 
these pharmacokinetic properties impact the pharmacodynamic properties of certain cannabinoids. THC, when it passes through your gut, as it does with, with edibles, like a cookie or a brownie, gets converted into 11-hydroxy-THC. The reason this is important is because 11-hydroxy-THC is stronger than THC itself, which is why when you eat an edible, you can get more high than when you smoke or vape. So the route of administration is an incredibly important element in better understanding the effects on behavior and um, brain development. So we're going to integrate both of these elements into the lab to better mimic human use patterns. We also plan to use more whole plant pharmacological approaches based on the idea that a whole plant, not only is that what's being used by humans, but it, it might be more therapeutic, therapeutically effective. Um, and this will hopefully allow us to gain insight into the proper cannabinoid and terpene compositions that promote the greatest efficacy, along with the fewest side effects. And then we hope to gain systematic assessment, uh, uh, to conduct a systematic assessment of how these different cannabinoids and terpenes are interact interacting at the cellular level using in vitro tech recording techniques such as slice electrophysiology, and in vitro calcium imaging, where we can add in systematically different doses and different cannabinoids and terpenes to identify their impact on neuronal output patterns and their communication patterns. So for instance, if we're interested in the uh, cannabinoids effects on driving inhibition, which would be relevant for a disorder like epilepsy, well, which pattern of, or combination of cannabinoids and terpenes leads to the greatest level of GABAergic inhibition in the brain. And we can do this systematically using these in vitro techniques. So once we identify the optimal cannabinoids and terpenes, the next question is how do we get this into a product that can be used by humans? And I think one of the limitations um, well, first of all, this really does, uh, you know, give us this opportunity to create better therapeutics that are more effective and safer. And I think that by understanding this cannabis code, um, that is the most effective combination of cannabinoids and terpenes for a particular condition, um, will really, I think this is a really important element in the future of cannabis-based therapies. But there's a challenge of getting it into products and strains in the optimal combinations. For one, creating cannabis uh, strains that are consistent is very challenging because the cannabinoid and terpene compositions depend on everything from soil um, composition to light levels to water levels. And, and this is just a really difficult process that is costly. It has a large environmental cost as well. It takes a lot of energy, a lot of water, a lot of effort to produce the cannabis flowers that we're all familiar with. So there might be a way around this. I'm not saying that this is the absolute future, but there are ways of bypassing um, these challenges with manipulating the genetic uh, expression of these cannabinoids. And that is through the optimization of um, basically using yeast to produce the cannabis. We can essentially, and there are labs that are working on this who have received millions of dollars in government funding to better study this process, but essentially what they're doing is they're taking the molecular machinery from the plant, sticking it into yeast, adding a bunch of sugar, and then a week later getting a particular cannabinoid or a terpene. And so you can make these cannabinoids and terpenes um, in a very rapid and cost-effective manner. So if you were thinking about using this long term, and you were thinking about this as far as cost, well, here's kind of your standard CBD tincture, which costs a lot of money. It's about $434 a gram. But if you need 1,000 <coughs> uh, milligrams per day to treat your epilepsy, this cost adds up. The labs that I've talked to who are producing these cannabinoids for yeast see that they can get it down to 20 cents a gram. So it might be more cost effective, you can gain better control, and again, as I said, it might be better overall for the environment. No pesticides, lower energy costs, 
So who knows, maybe in the next 10 years, the next high will be coming, not from the plant, but from yeast. Um, so with that, I'd love to take your questions. Thank you for your attention. Um, complex interactions at the level of individual neurons uh, and general neural circuits is contributing to the therapy of that So I think that provides um, kind of a good proof of principle, but in the end, we want to understand all the mechanisms by which they're acting, and that's going to come through targeting these multiple systems at once. Right. I, I guess the, the reason I asked that is because you mentioned how the fact that all the different it could be, right. Yeah, so, oh, I see what you're saying. But the, the problem is by, I see. So if you're saying if we hit, like, for instance, the GPR55 receptor to treat epilepsy, but serotonin receptors to treat anxiety, what if we were just to target those separately? Is that getting your question? That is one approach, but again, we, we really just don't have the data behind how those systems are interacting. And, and that would be one experimental approach to identify the interaction, and it's something that's absolutely worth exploring. But it's my hypothesis that based on some of the studies of the whole plant um, extracts, the multiple uh, components of the plant are leading to a protection against the overriding of those different systems in one way or another. And I just don't know how that works yet. But that's the benefit of some of these in vitro mechanistic studies that allow us to tease those components apart. Great question. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you for coming. Um, I'm a survivor of physical and sexual abuse, and at various points in my life I suffered from suicidal depression. And I found that not only did psych meds and cannabis not help me, in fact, they hindered my healing, um, I found that what I needed to do was actually feel my physical pain and my emotional pain. I needed to experience it instead of trying to mask it. And I also found that I needed to cry. For some reason in the society, we've decided that tears are unacceptable. And actually, I found that I need to cry to maintain my mental health. And um, at various points, uh, I've allowed those tears to, to come out. And the more they come out, um, the less uh, I feel the effects of being physically sexually abused. And I, I wish we would talk more about the, the healing effect of tears. Well, I appreciate you sharing your story uh, and being vulnerable in that position. I, I don't know the scientific um, support for that or the scientific mechanism by which that works. You know, I, I, I think there are many ways here of achieving wellness, and, and there are 
based on perhaps the reason why they came about in the first place could lead to or promote certain types of therapy that are more effective than others. You know, when we're talking about this from a preclinical standpoint, bringing these animals into the lab or testing them in the lab and looking at mechanisms of cannabinoids and terpenes, generally what we're doing is we're doing some sort of early life perturbation where we might be stressing them out or doing some sort of anxiety provoking effect and looking at then the rescue by these drugs. Or what is more common, we look at genetic perturbations to the brain systems and then looking how those drugs affect the impairments caused by the genetic mutation. And so, you know, in your case, there's a specific life event or a series of them that contributes to these effects, which might lead to a different type of therapeutic uh, strategy than in the case of a genetic hit to the system. What other animal cry emotional fears? Perhaps someone else can speak to that. I, I don't have the answer to that. Okay. I know my cats get sad when I leave. Okay. <laughs> but I, I don't, I, I, I'm sorry, I can't answer that question. But, okay. but those are very good points and absolutely worthy of a discussion. Thank you. Um, just a quick question. I'm just curious about um, what you define as a full plant extract. Um, is it like a rich in some of those? Is it like a tincture? Like what is a... Yeah, I think all of those elements. So, when I say whole plant, generally it's taking the, the resin from a plant or something and, and turning it into a product. But when in the literature, we often see whole plant as containing just a few of the cannabinoids and terpenes. So you're right to say that there's, there, or to acknowledge that there is kind of this varying definition of what it means to be whole plant. When I think of whole plant, I think of more than just CBD or more than just THC. Because when it comes to the academic literature, that's often what we're limited to, our individual cannabinoids. And even just the small addition of a little bit of THC can be enough to drive some of the therapeutic benefits. So yeah, all of those components you're talking about could fit into the category of whole plant. Yeah, adding on to that, so it would have some and stuff as well, and it causes some cure. That, yes, I, because again, I, I do believe that there is a, a role for the terpenes in driving some of these effects, but that's that's really <coughs> understood at this point. Um, and there are a lot of just really important controls that need to be done when it comes to the terpenes. For instance, are terpenes expressed in a high enough concentration in cannabis to have an effect on the road? And we don't really have an answer to that. Yeah. Regarding CBD itself, uh -huh. so we are talking about a very specific structure, compound, or a category with different kinds of modifications that can interact, let's say, with CB1 or CB2 receptors in different ways. In other words, is it kind of range of, of, of CBD itself? The CBD CBD is CBD is CBD. It's always the same molecular structure. Right. The difference is how it might interact with some of the other terpenes and cannabinoids at the level of the receptor or the individual neuron that contribute to some of the differential effects. Because, and, they, and, and this is a really important point because one of the most common questions I get is, does it matter if I get CBD from hemp or cannabis? Because the CBD from hemp is much less regulated than CBD from cannabis. But in terms of, yes, in terms of chemistry composition, we're doing the exact same. single molecule. Yes. Now, the second question, if in the single molecule, there are system, systematic studies in which you can identify how are the cellular events that happen in CB1 and CB2 affected by the target? by the individual, not for the rest of the system. In other words, how CB1 or CB2 are affected by, by this amount mm -hmm. when are in under different developmental stages oh, yeah. or a different stress condition. In other words, to see what is the basic oh. pharmacokinetic or the basic compound effect. I, I can't so, tell you how, if, what, what a great point that is, as well as how challenging it is to study this in for instance, humans, because CBD and THC are, their impacts are affected by so many of those components that you just said. Not only the developmental impact, but hormonal impacts. THC, for instance, impacts men and women differently. And I think this is shockingly uh, and, and importantly underappreciated. 
Estrogen, for instance, greatly increases the sensitivity to THC, uh, THC to CB1 receptors and their effects. So just, just the hormonal milieu out there can influence its effects on the endocannabinoid system. And the same thing with CBD. And the THC has been studied extensively at um, kind of the physiological level, in part because it's a lot easier to apply for a government grant to study the harm that THC has as a Schedule One drug than the therapeutic benefits of CBD, which by definition has no therapeutic benefits. So all of those elements are critical to consider when we're designing our experiments and, and something to, to look at. Thank you. Um, Actually, I'd, I'd like uh, everyone to have an opportunity to ask their question, but maybe what we can do is go outside, outside. Yeah, have some snacks, and if you have questions, feel free to ask Josh. Yeah, thank you for uh, your outside. time. Thank you. Thank you.